Early Life and Career In the annals of history, Kenji Daihara emerged from the environment of Okayama City in Okayama Prefecture. In his formative years, he traversed the hallowed halls of military preparatory institutions and triumphantly concluded his studies as part of the 16th cohort of the Imperial Japanese Army Academy in 1904, commencing his service as a fledgling officer in diverse infantry regiments. Dehara pursued higher learning and accomplished the curriculum of the 24th iteration of the Army Staff College in 1912. Notwithstanding his fervent aspirations for a laudable military trajectory, Dehara encountered impediments stemming from his family's modest social standing. Confronting this challenge head-on, he masterminded a stratagem involving his 15-year-old sister, tendering her as a concubine to a prince. In exchange for this pact, he secured a military rank and a coveted assignment to the Japanese embassy in Beijing, assuming the role of assistant to the military attaché, General Hideki TJ. Thus began Daihara's meteoric rise through the echelons of the military hierarchy. The tapestry of his early career unfolded across diverse postings in northern China, interrupted only by a brief interlude in 1921 to 1922, as part of the Japanese forces engaged in the Siberian intervention in eastern Russia. He was affiliated with the IJA 2nd Infantry Regiment from 1926 to 1927, and the IJA 3rd Infantry Regiment in 1927. Furthermore, he embarked on an official sojourn to China in 1927, serving with distinction in the ranks of the IJA 1st Division from 1927 to 1928. Fluency in Mandarin Chinese and other regional dialects facilitated Dohara's transition to the realm of military intelligence in 1928. Assuming this mantle, he masterminded the covert demise of Zhang Zuolin, the influential Chinese warlord reigning over Manchuria. His stratagem involved orchestrating the detonation of Zuolin's train during its passage from Beijing to Shenyang. Subsequently, he assumed the mantle of military advisor to the Kuomintang government until 1929. The accolades garnered from these exploits propelled Dehara to the rank of colonel in 1930, commanding the IJA 30th Infantry Regiment. Member of that 11 reliable to clique. Owing to his meritorious achievements, Dehara garnered acclaim, and by the dawn of 1930, he ascended to a post within the Imperial Japanese Army General Staff Office. In this influential role, he became an integral part of the distinguished 11 Reliable Consortium of Officers, collaborating closely with luminaries such as Hideki Tojo, Sishi Itagoki, Daisaku Komoto, Yoshio Kudo, Masakasu Matsumara, and others. This assemblage, known as the 11 Reliable, operated as an external entity linked to the more exclusive trio recognized as the Three Crows, Tetsuzan Nagata, Yasuji Okomura, and Toshishiro Obata. The Three Crows were dedicated to modernizing the Japanese military by dismantling archaic samurai traditions and challenging the influence of the CHSH and Satsuma clans, staunch advocates of those traditions. Behind these influential groups loomed the true orchestrator, Field Marshal Royal Prince Naruhiko Higashikuni, the uncle and advisor to Emperor Hirohito. Higashikuni masterminded a series of maneuvers, including fabricated coups, targeted assassinations, religious deceptions, and menacing threats of murder and extortion from 1930 to 1936. His objective was to incapacitate Japanese moderates opposing war by instilling fear. Higashikuni championed clandestine activities by loyal officers within intelligence departments to further the political agenda of his faction, known as Tseha. This faction embraced a materialistic, westernized approach to the empire's expansion, akin to colonization. This standpoint stood in stark contrast to the rival KDA faction, led by General Sadao Rocky, advocating for a more spiritual path to expansion, seeking to unite Asian peoples under a racial, rather than nationalistic, empire. While Dihara's alignment with this movement remains enigmatic, whether driven by ideology or opportunism, his military trajectory experienced a notable acceleration from that juncture. In 1931, he assumed responsibility for overseeing military intelligence operations for the Japanese Army of Manchuria in Tianjin. The subsequent year saw his transfer to Shenyang, where he assumed leadership of the Houghton Special Agency, the military intelligence arm of the Japanese Kwantung Army. Lawrence of Manchuria During his tenure in Tianjin, 
Dehara, in collaboration with Sishir Itagoki, orchestrated the infamous Mukden incident. This stratagem involved instructing Lieutenant Sumori Komoto to strategically place and detonate a bomb near the railway tracks as a Japanese train traversed the area. The bomb, regrettably feeble, inflicted minimal damage to the tracks, allowing the train to continue unscathed. However, the Imperial Japanese government falsely implicated the Chinese military in an unprovoked assault, furnishing grounds for the invasion and occupation of Manchuria. Dehara played a pivotal role in coordinating strategic collaboration among Northeastern Army Generals 11 Chia in Jilin, Zhong Jingwei in Harbin, and Zhong Haipeng at Daonan in the northwest of Liaoning Province during the invasion. Following this, Dehara undertook the mission of escorting the former Qing dynasty Emperor Puai back to Manchuria to legitimize the puppet regime. The plan entailed presenting Puai's return as a response to the fictitious popular demand of the people of Manchuria. With the aid of the legendary spy Kawashima Yoshiko, well acquainted with the Emperor, Dahara successfully ushered Puai into Manchuria before the port of Inko froze, meeting the November 16, 1931, deadline. In early 1932, Dahara assumed leadership of the Harbin Special Agency of the Quanting Army. Negotiations with General Ma Zhanshan, displaced from Kika by the Japanese, proved challenging due to Ma's ambiguous stance. Faced with an impasse, Dehara sought support from Manchurian warlord 11 Chia. When negotiations with Ma proved futile, Dehara orchestrated a riot in Harbin to rationalize Japanese intervention. This prompted the IJA 12th Division's involvement, resulting in the fall of Harbin on February 5, 1932. Formal Chinese resistance ceased, and within a month, the puppet state of Manchukuo was established under Dehara's supervision. He assumed the position of the mayor of Mukden and facilitated the puppet government's plea to Tokyo for military advice. In the ensuing months, a substantial Japanese force entered the newly formed protectorate. Dehara utilized them as an occupying army to enforce forced labor and instill fear, compelling the Chinese populace into submission. Despite Ma Zhanshan's persistent resistance, Dehara attempted to sway him with a substantial monetary offer and the command of the puppet state's army. Ma, feigning agreement, attended the founding meeting of Manchukuo in Mukden, securing the roles of War Minister of Manchukuo and Governor of Heilongjiang Province. However, utilizing Japanese funds, he raised a new volunteer force, resumed the struggle against the Japanese, and reinstated the Heilongjiang Provincial Government as part of the Republic of China in April 1932. From 1932 to 1933, Dehara, now a major general, commanded the IJA 9th Infantry Brigade of the IJA 5th Division. After the seizure of Reihei in Operation Neka, he returned to Manchukuo to lead the Houghton Special Agency until 1934. Subsequently, he was attached to the IJA 12th Division until 1936. For his pivotal role in the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, Dehara acquired the epithet Lawrence of Manchuria. This title, according to some accounts, inaccurately likened him to Colonel T. E. Lawrence, who fought for liberation rather than oppression. Second Sino-Japanese War and Second World War Between 1936 and 1937, Daihara assumed command of the 1st Depot Division in Japan. However, with the eruption of the Marco Polo Bridge incident, he was entrusted with leading the IJA 14th Division under the Japanese 1st Army in North China. Throughout this period, he played a pivotal role in the Beiping, Hanku Railway operation and spearheaded the campaign in northern and eastern Henan. Notably, his division confronted Chinese resistance in the Battle of Lan Fong, where Daihara took charge in countering the Chinese counteroffensive. Post the Battle of Lan Fong, Daihara transitioned to the Army General Staff, undertaking the position of head of the Daihara Special Agency until 1939. Subsequently, he assumed command of the Japanese 5th Army in Manchukuo, operating under the overarching authority of the Kwantung Army. In 1940, Daihara became a member of the Supreme War Council, influencing a shift in military policy in China to adopt the Three Alls approach, kill all, burn all, loot all. He then assumed the role of head of the Army Aeronautical Department of the Ministry of War and concurrently held the position of Inspector General of Army Aviation until 1943. Between 1940 and 1941, 
he served as the Commandant of the Imperial Japanese Army Academy. On November 4, 1941, in his capacity as a general in the Japanese Army Air Force and a member of the Supreme War Council, he cast a favorable vote for the attack on Pearl Harbor. In 1943, Daihara assumed the mantle of Commander-in-Chief of the Eastern District Army. The subsequent year saw his appointment as the Governor of Johor State in Malaya, concurrently serving as the Commander-in-Chief of the Japanese 7th Area Army in Singapore until 1945. Upon his return to Japan in 1945, Daihara received a promotion to Inspector General of Military Training, one of the most prestigious positions in the Army. Simultaneously, he held the role of Commander-in-Chief of the Japanese 12th Area Army. At the time of Japan's surrender in 1945, Daihara occupied the position of Commander-in-Chief of the 1st General Army. Criminal Activities Daihara's involvement in China went far beyond the typical activities of an intelligence officer. As the Chief of Japanese Secret Services in China, he orchestrated and oversaw a comprehensive array of operations aimed at systematically exploiting occupied areas and disrupting the social fabric of the rest of the country. His tactics were aimed at weakening public resistance through a variety of actions, including intentionally fostering criminality, promoting drug addiction, sponsoring terrorism, orchestrating assassinations, engaging in blackmail, bribery, opium trafficking, racketeering, and spreading corruption throughout the almost ungovernable country. The full scope of his activities and covert operations is not fully understood, but according to Ronald Sidney Seth, his efforts played a pivotal role in preventing a coordinated mass reaction in the invaded country, thereby shattering China's ability to confront Japan's expansion. Following the occupation of Manchuria, the Japanese Secret Service, under Daihara's supervision, transformed Manchukuo into a vast criminal enterprise. Institutionalized means of terrorizing and controlling Manchuria's Chinese and Russian populations included rape, child molestation, sexual humiliation, sadism, assault, and murder. Soldiers and gendarmes engaged in robbery, arbitrary confiscation of property, extortion, and the establishment of underground brothels, opium dens, gambling houses, and narcotics shops. Despite protests from conscientious Japanese officers, Tokyo ignored their concerns, leading to tragic consequences such as the ritual suicide of Gensue Baron Mutt Nobuyoshi, who had pleaded for mercy for the people of Manchuria in a note to Emperor Hirohito. Dehara expanded his operations into the unoccupied parts of China, employing approximately 80,000 paid Chinese criminals known as Chiang Mao Dao to find numerous criminal groups. These groups were utilized for various disruptive activities, turnovers, assassinations, and sabotage within unoccupied China. Controlling a significant portion of the opium traffic in China, Daihara used the proceeds to finance his covert operations. To extend his influence, Daihara recruited an army of agents posing as representatives of humanitarian organizations. They established thousands of health centers in villages, ostensibly for treating tuberculosis, which was prevalent in China at the time. By adulterating medicines with opium, he managed to addict millions of unsuspecting patients, exacerbating societal degeneration in areas previously unaffected by the breakdown of Chinese society. This scheme also created a pool of addicted victims desperate to offer any kind of service to secure a daily dose of opium. Initially, Dehara extended sustenance and shelter to tens of thousands of Russian white émigré women who sought refuge in the Far East following the defeat of the white Russian anti-Bolshevik movement in the Russian Civil War. Unfortunately, these women, bereft of means and predominantly widowed, were coerced by Daihara into a life of prostitution. He exploited their plight to establish an extensive network of brothels throughout China, subjecting them to deplorable conditions. The promotion of heroin and opium served as a coping mechanism for their dire circumstances. Once ensnared by addiction, these women were manipulated to further propagate opium use among the populace, receiving one complimentary opium pipe for every six they sold to their patrons. Securing backing from authorities in Tokyo, Daihara persuaded the Japanese tobacco industry, Mitsui of Mitsui Zaibatsu, to manufacture special cigarettes branded with the popular trademark Golden Bat. These cigarettes, prohibited in Japan and exclusively intended for export, were distributed and controlled by Daihara services in China and Manchuria. 
Concealed within each cigarette's mouthpiece was a small dose of opium or heroin, unwittingly addicting millions of consumers and contributing to the escalating number of drug addicts in the beleaguered country. Testimonies presented at the Tokyo War Crimes Trials in 1948 indicated that the revenue from this narcotization policy in China, including Manchukuo, was estimated at 20 to 30 million yen per year. Another source mentioned during the trial asserted that the Japanese military approximated the annual revenue at $300 million. Amid the tumultuous state of affairs in China, the corruption systematically propagated by Dahara soon infiltrated the highest echelons of power. In 1938, Chiang Kai-shek executed eight generals, all commanding Chinese divisions, upon discovering their collaboration as informers for Dahara's services. This marked the initiation of a series of executions of high-ranking Chinese officials found culpable of various dealings with Dahara over the subsequent six years of the war. Despite these purges, numerous Western observers in contact with the Chinese leadership opined that these actions failed to yield lasting results. Prosecution and Conviction After Japan's capitulation, Kenji Daihara was apprehended by the Allied occupation authorities and subsequently faced trial before the International Military Tribunal of the Far East as a Class A war criminal. Alongside fellow members of the Manchurian administration responsible for Japanese policies in the region, he was found culpable for his actions. Daihara received a death sentence, while his close associate Naoki Hoshino, a financial expert and director of the Japanese State Opium Monopoly Bureau in Manchuria, was sentenced to life imprisonment. The indictment highlighted that, acting as instruments of successive Japanese governments, they implemented a systematic policy of undermining the native inhabitants' will to resist by directly and indirectly encouraging the heightened production and importation of opium and other narcotics, and by fostering the sale and consumption of such drugs among the populace. On December 23, 1948, Kenji Daihara met his demise through hanging at Sagamo Prison, marking the culmination of the legal proceedings against him for his involvement in war crimes during the Japanese occupation period. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and share it. Your support is greatly appreciated, and you can find details on how to support my channels through PayPal and Patreon in the description box below.